Il y avait 100 ans, c'est fini. Thank you. Hello? Hello? I'm going to go over here just to mix things up. So last time I used a microphone was at my wedding, so <laughs> hopefully this will go better, but we'll see. So I, I'm, I am, if you can't hear me, if I speak too fast, if there's a medical emergency, anything, just let me know, uh, and I'll, I'll slow down. Uh, so I'm Simon, I help from Open Credo. I think he's got like a... I like complex problems, cats, and, and thank you very, very much for having me. Um, so Open Credo, uh, the purpose of Open Credo is really to create the conditions for stuff to succeed. Uh, thrive. And the kind of obstacles that we've helped tackle are slowing software delivery, increased firefights, all the things that you know and love that you've tried to tackle in organizations as well. Um, and the tools that we've used are ones that I want to share with you today. So hopefully you'll enjoy them as much as I have. Um, helping them sort of flourish, hopefully you're all in the right room. Uh, I want to tell you about the goal of business because I believe with no goal there's no improvement. I want to talk about NCOM, which is a a fictional but based on true story business, just to try and bring the tools to life a little bit, and some other things. Um, but really, as I go through, I'm going to be asking you questions. And the reason I want to be very clear, I ask you those questions, is to test me to make sure I'm com communicating the material in a way that makes sense, not to test you. But if you want to be tested, you're very welcome to be. Um, I'm going to try and draw on the thinking of lots of uh, incredible people, including my dad. And my only hope is I don't misrepresent their thinking. I'll do my best. So I'll start with the goal of business. I'm going to stop every now and then uh, just to give room for questions as well. So you test me. So the goal of a business. I believe the goal of a business is to increase profits now in the future. Um, and that sounds really, really capitalistic and really cold. But the key words for me are now and in the future. And the reason for that for me is we can't generate profits in the future if we don't satisfy the market. If we lose our customers today, if we kill the environment today, if we don't look after our shareholders today, there'll be no tomorrow for us as a business. And even closer to my heart, if we don't look after our employees, if we don't provide a secure and satisfying environment for our employees, well, they'll go elsewhere. So how can we generate a profit tomorrow and in the future if our employees have gone? So for me, what seems quite capitalistic is actually quite, quite holistic. In order to increase profits now in the future, the goal of the business, we need to look after our staff, we need to look after the environment. We need to look after our customers and our shareholders. If you agree with that, and just go along with me for a little while, if you do agree with me on that, I think there's two ways to increase profits. And I realize I'm in a KPMG office saying this, and I know they're probably going to test me on this. Um, the two ways I think we can increase profits now and in the future is by either prioritizing reducing costs. And my really elementary definition of that is making sure that of all the money flowing into the business, less goes back out. That's how simple I am. And the other way is to prioritize increasing revenue. And that's really just making sure more money comes to us to begin with. Really simplistic. And I want to talk about both of these points very, very quickly. And then I want to dive into the later one. So what's really interesting to me about uh, prioritizing reducing costs, there's two things. The first thing is, in a business, everything is a cost. Your people, your real estate, your travel expenses, your chairs, everything is a cost. And the problem with that is, if you prioritize reducing costs, where do you focus? There is no focus. Everything is a cost. You don't know where to begin. You don't know where to end, at least in my mind. The other thing is that you can only reduce costs down to zero. And if you do that, your business is wound up. There's no business left. There's no costs. So you don't want to do that. But what I'm trying to say is that there's only so far you can go with reducing costs. There's a, there's a limit. Whereas if we look at prioritizing increasing revenue, there's two things that stand out for me there. Firstly, it gives us a focus. I'm going to try and uh, convince you of that through the rest of the presentation, so you can hold me accountable for that. But the second thing is, theoretically, we can, there's, no, there's no theoretical limit on how much we can increase profits and I risk, uh, uh, revenue. I realize that's a really nice thing to say, and it's harder said than, uh, easier said than done, but that's what's really important to me about that. So in summary, prioritizing cost reduction inhibits focus, because everything is a cost in a business. Where do we start? Where do we end? And it limits improvement because we can only go down to zero. And if we do go down to zero, there's no business left. Whereas prioritizing revenue growth provides clear focus, as I'll try and convince you. And it also unlimits improvement. There's no limit to revenue, theoretically. I'm going to talk about NCOM in a second. Anything that comes up for you whilst I take a breather? Any questions? Any heckles? Anything? Uh, anything that doesn't feel right? Yeah. Questions, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, I want to ask, and you, you, know, you said, for example, that uh, if you're prioritizing cost, right? But the thing is, as you know, that in the future you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yes? Then, to, going to that logic, do you think that, do you think normally the concept of business as such, mm -hmm. anywhere around the world, mm -hmm. is a little bit flawed, do you think, slightly? Oh, that's really good. That's a question. Oh, no, that's a really good question. I think there's two things there, uh, and thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. There's, there's two things yeah. that come up for me. One is that, um, to your point, um, you've helped me see that when we prioritize is a really key word here. It's not that when we prioritize reducing costs that we forget about revenue. And it's not that when we prioritize increasing revenue that we let uh, costs spiral out of control. That's, that's the first thing. Um, it's just there's only one first position. And the other thing is, um, I'm going to feel like I'm in a difficult position here. I think cost accounting has been a very revolutionary invention. It's a very important one that remains with us. Um, but when it comes to uh, enabling local decisions by managers, there's other ways that we can make local decisions. So it's not that businesses are wrong in any way, um, but there's other ways that we can make uh, decisions. Uh, and I'm going to try and convince you of that, but t hold me accountable. Um, so that when we're uh, trying to work out where to spend our improvement efforts in an organization, we can focus on areas that matter most. So I don't think I've answered your question, but when I get to the end, can you tell me if it feels any clearer? Yep. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Because you put Deming on the picture. Yeah. I mean, after Deming, I'm not to be one of those guys, but Please. Deming would say increase quality. Yeah. To increase revenue, not increase revenue. Okay. Increase quality, and that will increase revenue. Sorry, I keep, I keep taking away. Um, what do you, I don't disagree, but what do you mean by quality? You're disagreeing with Dr. Deming then? Because no, 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 I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I think it means, what, what, what does quality mean? And if it's, uh, it's the service we provide in the eyes of the customer. It's statistics, it's, it's the class control, yeah. it's the constraints, it's, it's yes. a bunch of things. Oh, good. No, I like that. I think I'm in agreement with you. So I think um, it's... Sorry. People respond better to that, but, but the point is, you would say, you know, get the quality right, and then all those things will fall into place. Yes, I think that's quite right. And what I hope to get, uh, get to later on, and do keep me honest here, is that where do we begin when we think about that? And as, as you say, I think as you're saying, when it comes to profits, profits should be an effect of doing the right thing for the customer. So do hold me honest to that, John, please. Thank you very much. Any, oh, I'll carry I'll carry on. I'm going to... Yeah, 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 otherwise I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> is it a long conversation? Yeah, it's a long conversation. Uh, I'll need some beers for that. Okay, so income. Right, so income is a, a fictional business based on true stories. Uh, I just want to walk you through quickly what this very simplistic business looks like so we can talk about them in a bit more detail. So a bespoke software business in this case, Encom, starts with a customer needing help. Um, and we have a sales team, they find customers, they bring them in. We have designers that design interfaces really simplistically, oversimplifying. Uh, developers that develop the software and then finance that go and collect payments. Um, and then we should have some revenue coming in. It looks like a Monopoly board, so let's just make it look like a Monopoly board, right? Uh, let's go with it. And ideally, we want to go from left to right as quickly as possible, right? Quite, quite simple. So how, in this circumstance, I've told you a little bit about income. How do we increase profits? And this is probably quite a difficult question to ask because it depends, right? Uh, let, let me go with this one. I'll, I'll treat this one as rhetorical. So I'm really, really simple. So the way that I think, if, if I'm CEO of Encom, that I would increase profits as well, I'm like, well, collecting payments, that brings money into the business. So if we just collect more payments in any given period, we'll get more revenue, more profit, right? That's really good. Okay, cool. So we'll do that faster. But the problem is you can't collect payment until you've developed the software because there's nothing to collect payment for. So, okay, so let's do that one faster as well. The problem is we can't develop software faster unless we've designed... The interface, right? So, okay, well, well, let's do that one faster. But then we can't design interfaces for software for whom we don't have a customer, because that would be almost like minority report. That would be pretty impressive if we could. Um, so we need to do that faster. And I think all I'm getting to is that we just need to do everything faster and we generate more revenue. <laughs> uh, that, does, I don't know, that doesn't sound very helpful. So uh, for me, there's, there's an assumption that I haven't uncovered here, I think. And I think if we kind of, I love the Monopoly board, if we just take it away and imagine the company like a pipeline, I think maybe that'll help me bust my assumption. So my assumption in this diagram the, and in the previous one is that every part of the business operates at the same speed, the same clock speed. And I don't think that's true because even in software delivery, we see 
uh, work piling up between teams. And it's for multiple reasons, but I think every team is doing something unique, different, something different in a different way. So work is going to pile up because they're working at different rates. And so really a more accurate depiction, still simple, of an organization is probably something like this, where in any organization, every part is working at a different rate. And so there's probably one bottleneck, right? Because uh, by definition, a pipe has a bottleneck. Um, and in this case, in Encom's case, it was the developer, right? They could, the, it was through no fault of the developers, they were the ones that were constraining the flow of work across the organization. Um, and you can see that by work piling up. And there's one thing I really love about bottlenecks is um, that if we know where the bottleneck is and we know the rate at which it runs, so let's say the development, they could do, they can complete one project per month, whereas the rest of the organization could move much, much faster, what's the rate of revenue? Well, it's, it's the equivalent of the revenue of one project a month. Yeah, I think you know where I'm going now, John. <laughs> um, let me try and keep up with you. So, so the great thing about this is, even if we can collect payments at the rate of 10 projects a month, it's excess capacity because we're only able to collect payments on what we completed the development work for. So, so everything up here is, is kind of excess capacity. Even if the rest of the organization is running away, we can't use it. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, I've told you a little bit more. I'm going to treat this one as rhetorical as well. Uh, but how do you increase revenue? And again, I'm very, very simplistic. So, so my, my gut feeling is we probably need to do something around there, right? Because everything else is excess capacity. So we need to increase the throughput of the development team to increase the throughput of the company as a whole. If we don't increase the throughput of the development team, we won't have any bottom line impact, any impact on revenue. Um, quick question, this one will not be rhetorical. What happens if we instead focus improvement anywhere else on any of these other areas? Nothing. 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 Inventory. <laughs> Inventory grows. I like this. Anything else? Any, any? Unnecessary. Costs will rise. Costs will rise. Mm -hmm. mm, I like that. Yeah. Well, if fire the you fire the uh, Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So, so the way I answer it, I love these answers. They're better than mine. Is that give the, stuff give the, just piles up faster. So give the customer more incentive, basically. <laughs> give, the, give, the, okay. give the customer more, more incentive. Okay, fine. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. So, so I think if we improve any area other than development, work just piles up faster, as, as you said, John. Um, yeah, absolutely. So rate of a business, so the recap, rate of a business can generate money. The rate at which a business can generate money is equal to the rate of the slowest part, the bottleneck. Uh, if our priority is improving revenue, then we have a clear focus now, the bottleneck. And that's what I was alluding to at the beginning. If our focus is cutting costs, everything is a cost. Where do we start? Where do we end? Life as a manager is now really hard. Whereas if our focus <coughs> is on in increasing the rate in which we generate revenue, we find the bottleneck and we focus all our effort there or it's wasted. And improvement anywhere else, as you said, is a waste, is a cost, and leads to horrible, horrible things. Um, improving bottlenecks. I'll, I'll continue. I would have paused for questions, but I might get my wrist slapped, so I won't do that now. <laughs> so improving bottlenecks. So as we said, we want to get from everything from left to right as quickly as possible, but it's not a straight line. There's all these obstacles that get in the way of teams as they try and do their good work. And there's two things about obstacles that stand out for me. One is they're often, in, uh, you know, they rarely exist in isolation. So if I'm in my team, the obstacles I'm encountering are probably encountered by my colleagues, and we probably have similar obstacles encountered by in neighboring teams. They're never really, it's not just me that's alone, I hope. And the second thing is that, similar to when you go to your doctor, if you, you, know, you tell them your symptoms, generally those symptoms are pointing to an underlying cause, a single uh, ailment. And if you tackle the ailment, if you administer a cure, hopefully all the symptoms will go away. Your runny nose, your uh, what are list horrible symptoms here, they'll all go away if you can find the underlying ailment, the underlying cause. Similar in an organization, obstacles that many teams face and feel and that slowing the work down will tend to come from just a few common underlying causes. And I'll try and convince you of that later as best I can. Um, and so if we can find this, if we can find this elusive thing down here, then we can kind of help many teams. It's like buy one, get however many free. We can kind of, we can just kind of help the whole organization, right? Um, much, we kind of get um, an amplification effect for our efforts. Uh, so recap, an obstacle in any one part of the organization is often caused by something elsewhere, something that we can't see, it's out of sight, outside of the view of us in our team. Um, many obstacles tend to come from just a few underlying common causes, finally attacking the few underlying causes mean that we dissolve many obstacles with less effort. I think we've covered this, right? So whilst we've been in here talking about this, Encom gathered in the other room. The C-suite said, oh yeah, so, yeah our revenue's uh, dropping, this is really bad. Um, we like where you're going with this, Simon and, and team DevOps. So yes, we do need to improve the bottleneck development. And there's a few obstacles that we're seeing in and around that team. 
We're seeing that projects are moving slow and unpredictably. We're seeing staff are quitting, that's bad, right? And uh, we're seeing customers are going elsewhere. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce Agile to shorten feedback, loop, feedback loops. Because if we can catch issues earlier through those shorter feedback loops, it should help us, right? That would help at least the first one, projects move faster and more predictably. Is this a good solution? It depends. So, not in isolation. Not in isolation. Any other answers? Chin rubbing and a few kind of maybe. Okay, good. I like it. Yes, it depends. It depends. Um, it feels like there's a lot of things to be uncovered. I have two animations in this presentation. This is the last one. I promise. Oh, they're terrible. Um, and as Aikoff says, um, a problem never exists in isolation. It is surrounded by other problems in space and time, and in more of the context of a problem that a scientist can comprehend, the greater his chances of finding, finding a truly adequate solution. So what comes up for me here is the context of this problem is an organization. We need to understand the organization to understand, is this solution, this agile thing, going to help us? <coughs> and, and Steve Tenzer nicely steps in and he says, businesses seem complex, but how can they really be complex since we put them together? We just need to join the dots. And one way that we can understand the context, understand the organization, is through cause and effect thinking. And that's what I want to use with you today. Um, I'm going to use a current reality tree from the theory of constraints, Mr. John. Um, it's just a way of depicting cause and effect and helps us understand what are those few things that we can focus on to get you know, buy one, get many free. So the way that I'm going to talk you through it, but just to let you know what's coming, in a diagram, an arrow means if then. So if the lamp is not plugged in, the lamp will not turn on. Uh, and a circle is like an and clause. So if it is raining and if I'm outside, then I will get wet. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty simple. Cool. Okay, so these are all the obstacles that we mentioned earlier. Customers going elsewhere, projects moving slowly and unpredictably, staff are quitting. There's also one other that I alluded to but I didn't point out, which is margins are reducing. And even if we just uh, put these up here, I hope I didn't say anything wrong, John. <laughs> even if we just put these up here, oh, good. Okay. If, even if we just put these up here, we can start to see some cause and effect relationship. For example, if customers are going elsewhere, could that not be one reason why margin is reducing? And if staff are quitting and hiring, retaining, and training staff comes at a big cost to the business, is that not another reason that margin could be reducing? And if we take another fact, which is timeliness is important to customers. They came to Encom because they needed software build to solve a problem. And if it's not ready in or around when they need it, it's not going to be helpful. Then, if projects move slow and unpredictably and timeliness is important to customers, customers might go elsewhere. That might explain that. There's also something else that we saw, which was that staff were assigned to multiple projects at any one time. Um, and there's something else there. The world isn't predictable. Uh, we've seen that in the last few years, I think, right? And that means that a project may face urgent issues. And if a project faces urgent issues and staff are assigned to multiple projects at any one time, then an issue may ripple from one project to another, because any one individual can't be in two places at once. If this project's on fire, they can't be there and on the other project at the same time, so they need to go over there, and then this other project suffers. And if an issue on one project will ripple across others, it's maybe one reason why projects moving slow and unpredictably, and therefore we're coming in late, customers going elsewhere, and margins are reducing. It starts to explain a few things. Um, there's something else here that if staff are assigned to multiple projects, staff are fully utilized. They're very busy. And if staff are fully utilized, and no one individual in the organization can be successful in isolation, no developer, no single designer can ship the project on their own, they need to work together then it's another reason why projects may move slow and unpredictably. What I mean by this is if staff are fully utilized, it's more likely that they're going to have a queue of work ahead of them. And if there's a queue of work ahead of each member of staff, as they try and work together, work is going to move really slowly across the organization. Ah, OK, so if projects move slow and unpredictably, some staff initially may be twiddling their thumbs because like, a developer hands something off to a designer to get a bit of clarification. They need to wait for it to come back. But if we believe that maximizing staff utilization increases throughput, i.e. we can deliver more in any given period if everyone is fully busy all the time, that might be why we're assigning staff to more than one project, because we don't want twiddling thumbs. If we have twiddling thumbs, then it's wasted effort. There's things that we can do with that. We can deliver more projects. And there's a downward spiral here, right? So if we, if we, if we believe that maximizing staff utilization increases throughput, we'll assign staff to multiple projects, slows everything down, and we, you know, 
we make sure we assign staff to more projects to make sure that while they're twiddling their thumbs even more, they have more to do. All right. So I believe learning takes time. That's my assumption. And if learning takes time and staff are fully utilized, then they're not able to grow the skills that matter to them as an individual. And that's important. If motivation depends on mastery, if it depends on growing the skills that matter, and they can't, well, they'll feel demotivated and eventually they'll go elsewhere where they can learn. And maybe that's why staff are quitting. The problem is if staff quit, we have fewer staff spread across the remaining projects and we have to spread the, the few that we have left even more. And so we have another downward spiral. And that's it. Simple example. But what I'm trying to outline here is if we believe that maximizing staff utilization increases throughput, we'll assign staff to multiple projects. It means they're fully utilized. We have issues rippling across projects. We have queues building up in front of staff. Projects move slow and unpredictably across the organization. Our customers get really annoyed with us and bugger off. Uh, excuse my language. And also our staff can't learn. And so they leave. And then we have fewer staff to do more work. And so we're in a bit of a pickle. And our margins reduce. So, right. Where is the common underlying cause? If you could only focus your efforts in one or two places, let's go with one. Where would it be on this diagram? Yeah, my favorite. And maximize not, not maximize. Not maximize. So you're saying somewhere in the corner. Yeah. Right now. Okay, we have a vote down here. Do we have any other votes? Oh, we have a hand. Ooh, ooh, same, same, ooh, ooh, same. Two votes for down here. Uh, three, three, four. It's like a bid, I love it. Is that sorry? It's the single independent issue. It's the single independent issue. Ooh, I have something to learn there. Oh, I'm interested. I'm going to crack the answers. Okay, I like this. Anything else? And does anyone else see anything differently? That's absolutely, that's absolutely okay. Yeah. Motivate the staff. Motivate the staff. Tell me more about that. Because uh, if they're motivated, they're more likely to do a great job. And yeah. that's a snowball effect. And okay. they refer to other engineers. And, uh, okay, thank you. So I'm hearing that maybe if we intervene, if we intervene uh, there, then we have a snowball effect. Is that right? Cool. Interesting. Anything else? Uh, cool. I have two gentlemen here. Which have uh, you want to make like, uh, one project person. One project per person. Right. Sure, so like this. Not multiply, uh, not, not assign multiply projects. Cool, so you're looking over here, right? About like that. Anything else? Yes, sir. So, um, it's, it's funny because this scenario was it's pretty common to, yeah. to me because I worked in a company where we were struggling. Huh. And the way we made it better was to make the teams uh, self-sufficient so mm -hmm. we would have a team with all the capacity mm -hmm. within the team mm -hmm. so we had a, a, a so we were working in screen so we had mm -hmm. three developers one tester one platform engineer on a single yeah. team so we were pretty independent we wouldn't wait for a platform engineer to resolve its ticket because mm -hmm. we had one in the team that would understand all the scenario and how to resolve the problems mm -hmm. that we had at hand so context yeah. was there. Thanks. Thank so you. we could, within the team, we had solutions to actually resolve our problems. Okay. So in terms of velocity, that, 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 uh, we, we were not working like that. We had like a platform team separate yep. in the beginning. And then we got this agile guy, a bit of a crazy guy, <laughs> and he, he, he remodeled everything. Yeah. And all of a sudden, velocity was, I mean, uh, to this day, uh, I left the company, I got more money. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, and I regret to this day because that that model hmm. was we were working. I never worked as well and as efficient like hmm. like like those days because now I'm back at a platform team. I see. So I, see. I don't understand the context of yeah. the of the developer. So when I'm called to resolve a problem, I have to get the context first. That makes sense. And, and by the time I do it, sometimes it's not even the right one. Yep. When I was in the team, I was context. I mean, I knew. I want to hear the rest of this over a bit. No, this is great though. I'm hearing, I'm hearing two things. I'm hearing an extension of the previous answer around uh, kind of don't assign staff to multiple projects, but also kind of a way of uh, removing dependencies so each team can also work streamlined from left to right, less interventions. So there's a problem with that. You can create silos. This might be beer territory. I don't, I'm keen to learn more. So you can create silos yeah. when you have things that are yes. independent. Yes. So you do have to come up with ways to promote interoperability, yeah. but, but uh, I'll shut up now. No, no. Uh, <laughs> come at me later, bro. Um, one more. Oh, I'm so excited by this. 
basically on that screen there are only two issues, the yeah. two predicates that you can actually do anything about. Yeah. The others aren't going to change. Learning will take time. Motivation yeah. does depend on skills and timeliness does. So what are the predicates? Well, the two are essentially the maximizing yeah. and there's the interdependence. You have to break both of those, you've solved your problem. Love it. Thank you very much. I love this. Okay, cool. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm, I really want to spend more time with you. This definitely went better than my wedding speech, but I might have to grab you later. So please, uh, I'd love to hear, learn from you, so come to me later. Um, so I, I love these answers. So, ooh, okay. Uh, so my, 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 my personal answer, it's not necessarily the right one, is, is down here, uh, kind of where John was going and if we had a few votes. I think there's something for me to learn though, because you're seeing something quite cool over here. And, and the reason is, is because if this is a belief, and if we remove this belief, then we stop this happening. Because if we don't no longer believe that maximizing staff utilization increases throughput, we stop this. And if we stop that, we stop that. And if we stop that, we stop that. And it just goes, um, and I'll try and make that a bit more eloquent later on. Uh, right, so I had a question, which was, what would be the impact of the original solution? Going to be a little bit rhetorical, just in the interest of time, forgive me. So the original solution was introduced agile to short, shorter feedback loops. My gut feeling is, well, maybe we'll kind of catch a project facing urgent issues a little bit sooner, and therefore maybe there'll be less of a ripple effect. But the problem is there'll still be, if staff are still assigned to multiple projects, because we believe that maximizing staff utilization reduces throughput, we'll still have this happening. It's just we're trying to dampen the effect. It's trying to dampen the sentiment. It's like taking paracetamol, right? Um, so it's not bad, it's just not as impactful as it could be. So problems are often interconnected and best understood and tackled together. It'd be like the elephant, a paradox of an elephant. We need to be able to trace back to where is this coming from for impact. And Russell Aikoff says we fail more often because we solve the wrong problem than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. As we saw, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to have to speed up. Ah, cause and effect thinking can help us. Blah, 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 blah. Cool. Okay. Quick thinking exercise. I would love you to join these nine dots with four lines without removing your imaginary pen from your imaginary paper. You can see me trying over there. I'm going to give you 30 seconds because that's uh, quite a little bit of my budget. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to do it in your mind and I'll give you the answers. I'm sorry, otherwise I'm going to be told off. I'm grateful for the warning though. Um, just going to give you a second to think about it. Four straight lines, connect all nine dots. I, I can solve this, so. Um, just shows, just shows, if you can, how awesome. Yeah. I can see everyone like this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have got your paper. Eyes are moving, fingers are waggling, everyone's engaged. Okay, I'm going to give you the answer. Put you out of your misery. Forgive me if you close your eyes if you don't want to see this. Right, so one answer is, if you swoop past the, the top of the, uh, the top of the perimeter, you can do it in four goes. Um, and also if you fold the paper, your imaginary paper, uh, that would be quite impressive to do in your imagination, but yes. And Russell Aikoff says the creativity is shackled by self-imposed constraints. And so the reason that you might not be able to see the top right, the reason I can see the top right solution is because I need to break an assumption that I held on myself, which is that lines must be drawn within the perimeter of the square. And for this one, I didn't find this one because I assumed that paper must lie flat whilst lines are drawn, but that's not true. I, I, I constrained myself. Maybe you have the same experience. And so if we, yeah, so creative solutions often come from surfacing and reevaluating our assumption. And so what the frick is this? This is an assumption. Is it a valid assumption? Rhetorical learning because of time? No, not really. We've seen empirically how it plays out. It's horrible. It's horrible for the whole organization. And theoretically, it's also wrong. You know, Kingsman, Kingsman's formula, right? Above 85% utilization of a resource or an individual, you know, a bit of networking resource or an individual, and, and Q-Links grow to infinity. And so my mentor and friend puts this really well. He said, you should, only, you should never plan to more than 40%. So you have 20% time for improvement, 20% time for unplanned work, and then you'll never be above 80%. And your QLEDs will never grow to infinity and work will move across the organization much better. So we can replace this assumption. Um, right, so often the underlying cause is an assumption that no longer stands, blah, blah, blah. Right, um, where can technology help? I'm going to just, you know, okay, develop a pipeline. It's great, yeah. Right? So, you know, we can introduce some kind of automation over here, and that will provide some temporary relief to the developers because now some of their testing, some of their deployment, some of their hard work is automated. But really, at most, I think that might give them a bit of temporary relief because now they have a bit of time to grow. But if we still, if we haven't removed the cause of the problem, if we haven't, if we're still assigning staff to multiple projects because we believe we hold an assumption that maximizing staff utilization increases throughput, it's not going to help. We'll just assign them to more. 
Right? And so what we need to do is we need to change this assumption as well as maybe introduce some painkillers over here. And then what, what happens? Well, we stop this, you know, we plan work to 40% of capacity. Staff aren't assigned to multiple projects, as this gentleman said. Uh, staff are no longer fully utilized. They have time to learn. And issue one project can't ripple to multiple projects as easily because we don't have one person kind of conducting it. Um, Questions the relatively brief ones? Um, not you. I'm just going to make So, um, actually, before we go any further, Simon, did, did, did I mention that um, John Wilkes, like, uh, the esteemed Oxford Balloon, legend of the DevOps industry, would be here tonight? <laughs> I think that's it all. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, we'd like to have John here. John, do you have a question? Fantastic presentation. Two things. Um, one, if you haven't, you probably have seen Steve Jobs talk about ACOF. Oh, nice. There's a video out there. It's yeah. just brilliant. They brought him in for, at one point, and he just explains ACOF. The oh, second okay. is the other really nasty problem is yeah. downstream dependencies. Yeah. So the video project is a great story about like, how come it takes you 72 hours to do something, and they explain yeah. that they have nine downstream dependencies, and yeah. Q-Link gets up to 90%. The point is, I would highly recommend Dominic D. Grandis's uh, Making Work Physical. Make it's called the Five Pieces of Time. It's, it's just, it would fit really perfectly as an overlay to your presentation. Great presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Steve Jobs, take off, Making Work Physical. Thank you so much. And Dominic D. Grandis, Making Work Physical. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank making you. Work Physical, Dominic D. Grandis. Is that IT Revolution? Yeah. Yeah. And Chicken. Cool. Was there another question somewhere? Let's go over there. I was going to ask if you have any case studies, or uh, because I think definitely correct from where I'm understanding, but it's a different case when you go to speak to SLT or managers and go, hey, you need to change your mindset and reduce. So sort of thinking that maximizing your team is increasing your output yeah. is actually the cause of your output being redu reducing. So it's like, how do you then go about showing them that? Works. Yeah, no, um, so firstly, it's probably beer conversation, even though I don't drink, so that's probably a very weird <laughs> promise. But um, <laughs> yes, 100%, it's hard, and I'm still learning. I think part of it is, is a normative experience, so it's very easy for me to rationally sit here and explain and say, yes, if you do this, this will work, profits to the, but them being involved in understanding and feeling and smelling, smelling, sure. Uh, how things are working and it's not going as expected. If they actually part of the system come along the journey, I think there's more, and this is pulling on, I guess, Vanguard and Seddon and uh, Gyrus, I guess, um, maybe. Um, if we can get them involved in the change and understanding how the system isn't what they expect, that can help. It helps them start to break some of the assumptions and then they look for the answer of what the new assumption should be. But I, I'm still learning and I, I still have to, yeah, what you say is absolutely right. Thank you. Awesome, good question. Up for one more? Yeah. So how do you reach in practices at 40% load because currently most of teams that are work around people have hundred percent load? How 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 do you achieve this forty percent load? Because it would be quite difficult to go to the business and say, well everything stops, or how about the work stops and People will have to wait twice as long or even more to deliver. So, you just want to make sure. So, how do I convince someone to do that? Yeah, how, how, how do you start this, this, this discussion of yeah. the change? Oh, that's a good question. So, in this case, this is, this is a little fictitious, but I guess the way I would do it is I'd say, what happens if we don't change? And, and that gets the most I guess because they say, well, it's just not working. And ideally, uh, connect with those gentlemen, if they can be part of it and see why it's not working, if they can kind of come and be part of the teams and part of the understanding of the problem, uh, then that hopefully helps. But I think the cost of not changing um, is probably, hopefully, an incentive by this point, where my, you know, margins are reducing, staff are leaving, and hopefully they're, they're more keen to explore. But still, it's not easy, and your question's spot on. I think change is mandatory. Uh, no, change is not mandatory, but neither is survival. I think. Anyone know who said that? Demi. 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 Yeah. Cool. All right. Some brownie points for John. Cool. All right. Let's have a break. And first of all, let's say thank you so much to Simon. Sorry for watching. Thank you. Okay. So. Um, okay. So we've got. Food.